The Serpent Moon, Namu's Story. Emerald pines stood erect, still, arms poised low in a gesture of preservation. Even the ancient gnarled ones did not quiver as huffed breath and movement of fast-paced legs stirred the air. The priestesses gathered hand in hand, silently making their way out of the woods to the dark road. I held a thickness in my chest that I had never experienced in all seven of my years. Sadness, coupled with anticipation of magnanimous fate. Elida whispered gently in my ear, You can do this, Namu. Remember everything you have learned here. Remember the truth of Mother Goddess's words. Only love is real. Nothing else matters. I tried harder then, to trust that all would be well, to breathe through my heart and to let love wash away all fear. Though I was the youngest of all the priestesses, I had practiced my lessons well. I breathed in peace, love, and light to every cell of my body, just as I had been taught many times over. I surrounded my body in a halo of light while visualizing light flowing out the top of my head, the bottoms of my feet, my front, and my back. I chanted softly the words, Mother Goddess, protect me now. Mother Goddess, protect me now. The trembling subsided. I settled into a state of detached observance, serene yet alert. We walked to an alcove near the road where the trees gave way to the open sky. The full moon was covered in part by the shape of the serpent, a large guardian cloud that wrapped its body protectively around a luminous glow. The serpent moved not at all, but waited and watched with the wisdom of knowing, the eyes darkest of all. Ah, this is the image I need, Mother Goddess, a sign of alchemy, of healing. Yet the corners of my mind hinted at another meaning, one I would not allow myself to see clearly. Elida knew, Mautu knew, the other priestesses knew. A forecast of death and rebirth had been given. I dunked my head down, wiping the moisture from my upper lip onto the top of my shoulder. Elida held my hand in firm reassurance as all eyes turned upward. We were not mesmerized. This was a conscious awareness state. A time not of prayer, but of listening to divine instruction. I knew to concentrate on receiving. Yet such a moment in time led my child's mind to question. It took all my power of concentration just to remain quiet. I did not want to interrupt my sister priestesses from their reverence and from possibly receiving the important information we needed at that moment. Blood thumped like a heartbeat within my ears as I strained to hear what revealed itself with the lightest of tapping, like rain splattering on the rocks across a creek bed. I did not tax my ears over much as the sound intensified until fully exposed as the downpour of hooves at a slow, steady gallop. My sisters remained calm, focused. I squeezed Elida's hand, wanting her reassurance. She squeezed back, though still intent on receiving inner guidance. I knew her ears did not ache, as she did not listen with the human ear. I remained silent on the outside, as my inner poise dissolved. They stopped abruptly when Gantian spotted us standing brightly in white gowns by the side of the road. So unusual a sight against the dim drape of the forest that at first it seemed as though his mind had refused to register just what it was he had come upon. He held his hand up to halt the others as the briefest signs of fear broke out across his face, quickly covered by a snort of anger. Who among my men had a wagging tongue setting a warning forth? Must have been you, Bartramus. I always suspected you had a soft spot for Olida. Gantian cursed out loud, as anger obviously crept even deeper through his veins. Bartramus's lack of response must have led Gantian to another conclusion. He spit on the ground and narrowed his eyes, looking us over one by one. Of course they knew we were coming. The ways of the witch need no earthly warning. The men moved forward again, yet so slowly one would think it was they who had everything to fear. Old and young eyes alike all had that wide open stare, taking quick blinks to guard themselves against any form of magic that could take them had their eyes been shut just a moment too long. Twenty-five of Lord Colner's finest knights, fully armed, approached. Not that they needed weaponry, with arms and necks as thick and finely corded as the steeds they strode upon. 
Lord Colner obviously believed it would take a mighty army to bring down eleven wispy maidens. Elida waited until they were but ten yards away. She dropped hands, as did all the other priestesses, and extended both arms towards the heavens. Welcome to the lands where we dwell. We have been expecting your arrival, knowing Lord Colner has sent you with some manner of business to discuss. There is not much discussion needed, Lady Olida. Gantian's voice boomed overly loud and harsh. By King Rupert's law, no witchcraft is to be performed in this country. You broke that law, and Lord Colner has sent us to make sure you pay for this crime. I beg you, sir, to listen to truth before you condemn us so, Olida said, with her voice remaining calm. Lady Solta was brought to us by her attendants at her own request. She had been bleeding for days before she arrived here. The baby was not far enough along to survive outside a mother's womb. We do have some herbs and teas that can help to stop a labor, but it was too late for that. She lost that little one just before arriving. The best we could do was to have her rest in our gardens, stop the after bleeding, and help her regain her strength for the journey home. Elida's voice was the clear coo of the dove, penetrating truth through air thick with clouded vapor. Why would she come here, of all ungodly places, ill and weak and knowing her husband would absolutely forbid it, Gantian said, with his veins in his temples bulging, as he spewed his words violently at Elida. It was obvious that the vapor had seeped through his skin, shrouding his brain in a black web. What manner of spell did you cast to draw her here? Perhaps you plan to capture her child and raise one more witch among you? It was the sixth pregnancy Lady Solta had endured without a child to show for it, sir. She said her husband, Lord Colner, suffered greatly with heartache over having no heir. He also feared for the future of his lands without strong sons to carry on his title as Duke of Bellington, Elida answered, and then paused as if choosing her next words carefully. Then she waved a slender hand over her shoulder. Having heard of the healing powers of the herbs we grow in our gardens, Lady Solta decided to take the chance to come to us for help. She was desperate, sir, believing her husband would choose another, someone capable of bearing an heir. Why not send for these herbs, then, Gantian said with a sneer. Why put her and the baby's life in further peril by journeying so far from their lands? As I said, sir, she had already been bleeding for days. Time may have weighed her decision. Elida put a finger to her lips. She knew Lady Solta had also heard that the priestesses invoked blessings from the Divine Mother. They were all practiced in channeling goddess energy through their hands to bring healing to those who believed. That is not something you can put in a pouch to send along with a courier. Though they could have directed blessings from afar, Lady Solta had no knowledge of that. This information Elida knew to keep private. Of course, we could not have allowed our herbs to be taken to her anyway, as it is forbidden by law. Forbidden by law? What kind of laws can protect our good people from witchcraft? You knew she was with child and lured her here with your evil intentions, just like you knew we were coming and stood waiting for us by the road. A spell was cast on Lady Solta, and Lord Colner has decreed that you must pay for this. We are here to carry out his orders. Gantian glared at his men, urging fear to choke their hearts and raise the pressure there. I looked up, knowing the stars with all the power of their glow were still witness, though hidden in this weave of gloom. I begged their help. The tallest of the grandfather pines began to nod, summoning wind. Yes, let wind clear this hazing of mind and men, I prayed. Elida continued to remain calm, her voice gentle with confidence. The men, still mounted on their horses, preferred to keep their eyes on the priestess. Elida's beauty was legend, yet it had been many years since she had been seen in the villages and manors. A slice of moon radiated off her olive skin as she once again raised her graceful arms up towards the heavens, with her blue eyes clear as undisturbed lakes, her chin pointed up, and her long velvety hair falling back as it softly touched the hem of her gown. I beg you, sir, to reconsider to hear the truth of my words. Yes, at times we know of things to come. It is given to us in the form of visions, nature signs, and animal calls. No witchcraft has taken place. 
No spells have been conjured against Lady Solta and Lord Colner. I understand that they are in great pain over the loss of their unborn children. Yet bringing harm to us will not lessen that pain. We are a peaceful people, living by nature, loving nature, and intending for all people to live in peace and harmony with nature and with one another. Though our way of living differs from yours, we have harmed no one. Our intentions are honorable. For the first time, Gantin seemed to be hearing Elida and considering her words. Then anger once again crossed his face. How dare you attempt to enchant me with your breathtaking beauty, your seemingly sweet words? Ah, look, you have enchanted my men as well. He glanced at the men behind him, catching them looking with soft eyes at Elida. His hand cut through the air as if slashing a sword against a mighty opponent in battle. Get down off your horses now. We have Lord Colner's business to attend to. They tied ropes around our hands then and led us back through the forest to the place where our roomy cottage met up with a wide lake. But here there was plenty of open space where our gardens had been cleared and put to rest for the coming winter. Nothing stirred, not a frightened rabbit running in the brush, not a lap of tide hurrying to the shore, not a howl or hoot resonating in the backdrop. I noticed Elida gently push the one they call Bartramus in my direction as they aimed us to form a circle. At least two men guarded each priestess. Fear not for me, Elida whispered to Bartramus. Take care of Namu. Take care of our baby. Bartramus's chin jutted out and his eyebrows rose as if to speak. Instead, he grimaced in silence and tried to keep me close to Elida, shoving other men out of his way. I surely can guard one mere child by myself, he muttered to anyone coming near. Though Bartramus was a good decade younger than Yantian, he had earned high status among the knights due to honorable skills both in battle and in the jousting tournaments held in times of leisure. He was a man others respected and listened to, but Gantian held ultimate authority in any decision, as was his duty appointed by Lord Colner. I noticed that not all of the priestesses were holding the peace in their heart, as Elida bade us do under all circumstances, especially in times of duress. Yet surely even Elida and Maltu's heart skipped a beat or two? I saw one teardrop escape down Valvia's cheek and drew comfort. Valvia was closest to my age, though four years older. Somehow knowing that I wasn't the only one having trouble holding the peace in my heart made me feel like less of a baby. For the pounding in my chest was close to giving way to uncontrollable sobbing. Gantian made his way to the center of the circle and planted his wide, muscular body. Perhaps he had been a handsome man in his early years, but now he carried the look of the vulture. His nose held a large bump midway, yet flattened out at the tip. Large, dark, and drooping circles framed piercing green eyes. His hair receded almost to the crown of his head. What remained was a tangled array of black and gray wire that grazed his shoulder blades. Much scarring had affected his face and arms, and no doubt other areas of his body covered by leggings and tunic. His gaze settled south, focusing mostly on Elida, Kamatu, and surprisingly, me. My decision as to how the women will pay for their crime has been made. It is a final decision and will not be discussed further. At this, he looked each of the knights in the eye, taking his time when focusing on Bartramus. I have been given this authority by Lord Colner. Disobeying me in this decision is committing a crime against King Rupert's law and Lord Colner's orders. Nervous tension flavored the air then, mostly coming from some of the knights, as they knew Gantian's capacity for cruelty. Gantian acted disturbed by his men's reaction. My good men, I also have no stomach for torturing women, rest assured, especially those of beauty fair, nor shall anyone be killed here this night. Yet I must send a strong message to these women to ensure the safety of our good people. A crime must be met with a payment of equal measure to the suffering bestowed upon Lady Solta and Lord Colner, as decreed by law, King Rupert's law. A child has been taken from this world before entering fully to his destiny and to the joy of Lady Solta and Lord Colner. He cleared his throat and pointed a menacing finger at several of the priestesses. These women saw to that. 
In their conjuring evil ways, they lured a fragile lady to come to their lands, and for what? To steal a child, that's what. To raise another, to add strength to their numbers in unholy intention. Now it is time they pay, and pay dearly, so as to never again attempt such an evil crime. Gantian paused only briefly before delivering the sentence. Therefore, I have decided that they will pay the price with their child. The one they call Namu, the youngest among them. The child's hands will be severed, thereby preventing one more witch from coming of age to conjure more spells against our good people. A child for a child. If she lives, so be it. What harm is a witch without her hands? Elida and Bartramus both began an attempt at a reply at the same time. Some of the knights had nodded in agreement to Gantian's decision. Others looked disgusted. The priestesses remained completely still, as if holding their breath, while their eyes focused on Elida. The sobs I worked so hard to dissolve broke forth with a terror I had never known. Silence! Gantian yelled fiercely. For one seemingly eternal moment, all fell silent except the sobs that would not be contained in my throat. Before Gantian started to bark out the orders to begin the carrying out of the sentence, an unfamiliar sound filled the air. A musical chant containing an ancient summons of the goddess energy could be heard, could be felt by all who stood in those gardens. I did not know where it came from at first. I just let it carry off to the trees some of the pressure I felt in my chest, in my head, for a moment, I gazed down at my hands. I was proud of how brown they had turned under the nurturing sun, proof of the hours I spent in the gardens giving love to the goddess's soil, her fruits, her vegetables, and her grains. Elida had told me many times as she held my small palms up to hers, these are good hands, Nemu. They are sacred, they are beautiful, and they hold many gifts. See your long fingers. It's the sign of a healer. You're a healer, Namu. I knew that the first day I saw you. And she would draw her palms a little ways away from mine. Feel the energy, Namu? That is a gift from Mother Goddess. Use it well, my sweet one, as there are many who need Mother's blessings in this world. I shall teach you to direct it for the good of all Mother's creations. My hands would always heat up the most when combined with the energy of Elida's hands. It would be as if the soles of my feet opened up and a fire deep within the womb of Mother Earth would stream up my legs, filling my heart with intense love energy, which flowed out the top of my head and down my arms, radiating out my palms. I began to feel the heat coming through my hands even then, even in my deepest terror. That chant, that voice, so soothing to my soul. Where was it coming from? My gaze went to Elida, and then passed her to Mautu. Perhaps there is a limit to how much shock one can endure at one point in time, because it seemed almost a natural sight to see Mautu standing there. Standing there with her arms lifted to the heavens, a smile upon her face, she wooed the goddess in the most beautiful voice these gardens had ever listened to.